Alrighty. Uh, can everyone hear me okay, or do I need to speak into this thing? You need to speak, speak to into the this. Big that one. better? Yep. There we go. So, uh, my name is Reese Thomas. I, as Lauren was saying, I work as the Neuropsychiatry Registrar over at the Royal Brisbane. Um, and my role in neuropsychiatry is a rather unique one that I'll spend a bit of time explaining today. Um, I do just want to point out that very briefly in this talk, I do touch on some challenging topics like depression and suicide. That can be really confronting for people that might have either had a lived experience with that or know someone who's experienced those things. It is only briefly touched on, but I just wanted to mention that just in case. So the goal of my talk today is to hopefully just provide a little snapshot of what I do and some of the things that I offer in the clinic. Um, really try and destigmatize some of the mental health impacts of Huntington's disease, which you'll see later on are actually really, really common. Um, and then to uh, sort of put forward some of my own personal thoughts and views on some of the challenges and how we might combat that in the future. I think I probably am obliged to say that the views therein are my own and no one else's, um, just in case I say anything too controversial. So, as I said, today we will cover a bit of a general introduction as to what is neuropsychiatry and why it's relevant, basically justifying my own existence. Um, explain what happens within neuropsychiatry and the RBH, Huntington's Disease Clinic. Um, talk about some of these common problems that arise and how we commonly treat them. Uh, and the challenges and my wish list for the future. I do want to provide some reassurance that at 4pm on a Friday afternoon, this is not what we will be covering. <laughs> Thank you to my supervisor, Rodney Marsh, for providing these slides. <laughs> so, what is neuropsychiatry? I can reassure you, it is not this. So, neuropsychiatry, the best way I can explain it, is that it's the interface of the brain and the mind, the mind and the body. Um, it is a subspecialty area within psychiatry, so really the, the capital should be in the P, not the N in that word. Um, and it falls under the umbrella of a specific branch of psychiatry called uh, consultation liaison psychiatry, which for some reason I always feel compelled to describe with a vaguely French accent. Um, what that means is that it's both the consultation to um, uh, patients uh, who are suffering from the condition, as well as the liaison between different specialties. Uh, so we provide the psychiatric care for people that have medical and surgical problems, uh, and we're often embedded within other medical services. Um, so Rod and I, for example, work uh, within the neurology department at the Royal Brisbane. Um, it's really important to recognise that even though we do t talk on medications in this presentation, the whole idea or the whole shtick of this work is to actually provide holistic care uh, that reduces the suffering from the Huntington's disease itself, as well as any comorbid mental illness. So the RBH Huntington's Clinic was I believe established in 1994. It's a statewide liaison service with a multidisciplinary team consisting of neurology, psychiatry, speech pathology, neuropsychology, which is obviously incredibly different to neuropsychiatry, as well as nursing. We work really closely with Huntington's Queensland. It's a highlight of my month to see those two smiling faces attending at the clinic. Um, and generally, most people that are involved with our clinic will be on about a 12 monthly appointment schedule. We provide assessments and treatment recommendations, but unfortunately, and spoiler alert, this might come up again later when I'm talking about challenges, we're not really able to provide that frequent, regular follow-up that I feel might be necessary. 
Uh, and all in all, we see around 160 to 170 patients per year in that clinic. So, what are some of the common neuropsychiatric problems in Huntington's disease? So, big data studies that I'll, I dumb down for myself and hopefully I can then share with the audience. Um, around 70% of carriers of the gene had neuropsychiatric symptoms within the data collection period. Of those people, apathy affected around 47 or nearly one in two people. Depression was also really, really common. Uh, and as you can see, a significant portion of those were the more severe end of those um, problems. Uh, irritability and aggression, again, is another common neuropsychiatric complication, as well as obsessive compulsive, compulsive behaviours and psychosis, which although not as common as the others, is an important complication that needs to be recognised. Um, in the interest of time today, I'll just be focusing in on a few of these problems, which should have uh, come up in bold if my formatting worked. Thank you. <laughs> so... This is just, I, I think sometimes it's easier to see information pre presented in a couple of different ways. This is a really nice graph that shows uh, the frequency or prevalence of these problems over time between stage one, two, three, and then late stage Huntington's disease. As you can see, the apathy problem really just increases and increases with each stage of the illness. Um, the other problems do also scale up, but interestingly, the psychosis problem tends to remain at a relatively low rate throughout the course of the illness. The next slide is one that I have indeed stolen from Dr. Rodney Marsh. It's a beautifully drawn graph, I believe drawn by Rodney himself, um, which shows that depending on where you are you're in the illness, different features will become more of a problem. So, you know, early on, anxiety, irritability can be a really big problem. And I actually often see people where before they've gotten any of the chorea or movement problems, they're noticing that change within themselves. Um, whereas later on, it can be other issues like dementia that really take, forward, take hold. Um, I will flag that even though dementia is a really big problem within Huntington's disease, um, it's not the focus of my talk today. So, moving on to apathy, something that we should all care about. I hope the pun was appreciated, thank you. There are three main, three main domains within apathy. You've got the behavioural component, which involves effort, initiative, productivity, it's that will to actually get out of bed in the morning, have your shower, make your coffee and will yourself to come to work. Um, the cognitive, so interests, hobbies, loves, um, planning and long-term goals, and then emotional, uh, which you know someone might have a bit more of a flat affect where they're not as responsive as they might normally be. You know, uh, they find out that their daughter's getting married and they go, oh, that's nice, dear. And they're actually fond of the fiancé as well. Um, it's that important, that emotional responsiveness. Um, this, of course, can be associated with quite significant decreased quality in life, uh, decreased health behaviours, um, including sort of not showering, uh, not maintaining good nutrition, not exercising regularly and those kinds of things. Uh, and loss of function, and these include within employment as well as within relationships. Um, what I've seen is that this can be extremely distressing, particularly for the people that love the person with Huntington's, but it's often less distressing for the person it themselves. Sort of by its nature in that apathy means that loss of interest and loss of passion um, it extends actually to the apathy itself. So they become quite apathetic about their own apathy, um, which for all the people around them going, hey, let's do this on the weekend and things like that, that can actually be really, really hard and puts a big strain on some of these relationships. 
Um, interestingly, it also poses some ethical challenges. You know, I've made the joke before that I, I, if I had to do hotel quarantine or something like that, I'd probably be quite okay spending two re weeks locked in a room watching Netflix or playing my PlayStation. <laughs> Sounds like a bit of a dream to me. Um, and if someone told me that I needed to be exercising every day and things like that during that, I'd probably tell them to bugger off. Um, and that's actually what happens as well sometimes in that it creates that tension and particularly when the irritability starts to come in as well where people will start to push away those that love them and the people that love them will often see it as a, well, they don't want me to do it. And that can be a real challenge that, unfortunately, I don't know that I have a good solution to. Treatments, medications don't really do very much uh, for this particular domain. Um, there's no good evidence to support a particular medication for treating apathy itself. Um, but it's likely that that multidisciplinary approach where engaging occupational therapists, NGO support workers and things like that may make some improvement. Moving on to depression. Um, so we get criticised a little bit in psychiatry because we've got this great book called the uh, DSM, or Diagnostic Skills Manual. It's a little bit of a paint-by-numbers to diagnosing mental illness. You know, theoretically, any man or his dog could get out this book and go, oh, yes, this person has five of nine criteria, therefore they have this condition. It's a little bit more nuanced when working with people with really complex mental, uh, medical problems as well. So if we look through this list of features where you need to have five and then through the powers of PowerPoint, I highlight some of these ones which are all symptoms of Huntington's disease itself or treatments that we use to treat Huntington's disease. You really only need to have one thing which might be a depressed mood to satisfy this criteria. So rather than just doing the paint by numbers approach, I like to use a little bit more um, of the thinking part of my brain um, and focus more on exploring those depressed mood symptoms. So really what we're looking for here is that intractable sadness. Um, people that are depressed have a profound loss of interest and they don't get that joy uh, from the things that would normally uh, spark joy within them. So these are the people who have always had a passion for theatre, uh, who, you know, when they go and see Phantom of the Opera or Hamilton, uh, which sadly my plans to do that were ruined this year by COVID, um, they just don't get that spark from it. Um, often it's accompanied by feelings of guilt, burdensomeness, worthlessness, you know, despite that reassurance from family that they're actually, you know, still a valued part of that family. And it's really hard to shake. Um, in addition to this, that's where a lot of those suicidal thoughts can start to come in. And if someone's talking about, you know, feeling like a burden, feeling hopeless, worthless, and these, that it's, a, it's like a dark cloud is over them. Um, I usually do ask about suicide because unfortunately people with Huntington's do have much higher rates of attempted and completed suicide than the general population. Um, some studies show that it could be between a 7 to 12 times risk of suicide, which is actually really heartbreaking um, considering that depression itself is actually a really treatable problem. One thing that I also want to make the distinction of is that Huntington's itself is a really difficult illness to be diagnosed with. I'm probably not saying anything too radical talking to this audience. Um, so I ask the question, is it okay to feel sad about being diagnosed with a life-changing illness? Yes. Yes, it is. However, if someone's depressed... Should we provide treatment? Yes. Oh, I heard one no from the audience there. <laughs> Cheeky. <laughs> so, treatments of depression. Treatments of depression? Treatments of depression. So, 
there's a, actually really good evidence to support the use of antidepressants. Um, bearing in mind throughout my talk when I talk about the evidence base, um, with the exception of one particular miracle medication, um, most of it is about the general evidence in treating depression more generally. Um, gone are the days with antidepressants where they're these awful drugs that, you know, they make you feel worse than the actual depression did. Um, these days, they're all, they're mostly really, really well tolerated. And we can actually target, you know, different side effect profiles for different people. So, you know, the person that's really down, not sleeping, not eating, we've got a great drug for them. It's called metazapine because it makes you feel better, helps you sleep and stimulates your appetite. Someone, though, that's maybe overeating and things like that, some of the other medications might be helpful. Um, and really importantly, also utilising some of those non-medication treatments. So the supportive therapy and more formalised um, therapies from psychologists can be really helpful, as well as all of the lifestyle factors we can modify, like engaging people in their community, giving them things to look forward to, are all so helpful in lifting mood. Irritability and aggression. Now, this obviously isn't a diagnosis in of itself, but I think it's really important to talk about because it can be a highly damaging problem. Um, I've seen people who end up having problems with the police and things like that, which, let me tell you, having to you know, face court or something like that, spoiler alert, doesn't help your mental health at all. So if we can get in there early with some of these problems and provide some really safe and effective treatments for it, we can avoid a world of pain. In addition to that, it can be absolutely devastating for families seeing that you know, loved one who you know, wouldn't hurt a fly suddenly have that change within their personality and have that agitation and that aggression. You know, people that you know, literally wouldn't have hurt a fly you know, who end up assaulting family members and things like that, which is, uh, to me, just, just awful to see that change. Um, later on as well, it can then make it really hard when we're working with, um, like, NGO supports and things like that uh, in terms of the workers not feeling safe within the workplace and the difficulties um, that then arise with providing care. So it can be a real tricky thing to manage. Fortunately, I say there's no magic pills, but risperidone is actually a really, really good medication for this problem. If I had Huntington's and had this problem, sign me up for maybe half a milligram of risperidone at night and titrate that to effect. It can be amazing for people. We see that irritability wash away. We see some of their usual self come back. It's not a cure for the progression of the illness, and we do find that we need to increase the doses over time, but it gives people more of that quality time and gives them better time with their families, which I think is so important, as well as negating some of those other problems as well. Um, just for those playing at home, risperidone is an atypical antipsychotic. Um, now, that's a little bit of a misnomer because these days atypical is actually the most used class of antipsychotic and we're not actually using it to treat psychosis in this particular problem. It's the calming, relaxing effects. And the best part is rather than other medications like Valium, it doesn't have the same problems with dependence, which is really good. Um, just we've got a, if there's any clinicians in the audience, we do have a couple of other options of medications that work quite well, um, but they're not as well studied as the risperidone. Um, and another thing that I wanted to highlight here is also the role of behavioural psychology. Um, so particularly for people that are maybe in that more advanced stage of their illness um, where they've got more of a problem with the dementia, the behavioural psychology can introduce really clever ways of helping to decrease distress and decrease the agitation and irritability that comes with it. So, what are some of the challenges that we've experienced? Um, 
there are very limited novel treatments or new medications that are coming through the pipeline. Uh, so we heard this morning actually about some of those uh, trials which are more focused on Huntington's itself rather than the neuropsychiatric complications. Um, there aren't really many promising studies that I'm aware of um, with focus on the neuropsychiatric complications. Um, deep brain stimulators, probably not going to be particularly helpful for the neuropsych complications of Huntington's. Um, there's challenges of treatment adherence. So I, I wear a few different hats. You'll hear about some of them uh, late, slightly later on. Um, in my more general psychiatry hat, you know, when people are struggling to remember to take medications, we'll often have people who voluntarily agree to have, you know, a monthly injection of the medication so they don't have to worry about it. Um, for some reason within Huntington's, there's a lot of reluctance for people to use these medications, which theoretically you can actually use lower doses of the medication overall. Um, limited accessibility of mental health services. Uh, and also I find a real reluctance within mental health services, of which I you know, obviously am a part of, um, to take ownership of looking after people with Huntington's. There's a great divide within medicine um, between what might be called an organic problem, which is where there's a, you know, a test to explain it or a gene to explain it, versus um, traditional mental illness like you know, schizophrenia or something like that, where we don't have a blood test that can answer why that person has it. And there's a real reluctance within psychiatry to continue providing treatment um, for this population who might have an explainable um, cause for their mental health problems. Um, one interesting challenge within that is that I've seen many people who sort of look like they've got barn door traditional schizophrenia um, who incidentally have come back with a positive Huntington's disease uh, gene test that I go, it, honestly, if I didn't have that little bit of information, uh, they would you know, be rece receiving the case management services and things like that of the public mental health system. And I actually wonder, you know, even if they didn't have Huntington's, would they still have this schizophrenia-like illness? Um, obviously, no way of knowing, but it is a thought that I have. Um, the other challenge that I touched on earlier is that a service that does have the expertise and a bit of experience, you know, I'm going to point Rod out again, who I believe has been working at the Huntington's Clinic for, is it 20 years, over 20 years now, Dr. Marsh? Hey, I'm pretty sure you started in 2000. Mm. Um, where these services that do have the expertise, because we're so filled up already with our one clinic a month, um, we're not actually able to provide the gold standard ongoing treatment uh, that I think is a little bit of a no-brainer. Um, now, you'll have to excuse me because sometimes my friends say that my favourite place to be is on my high horse. Um, it's a terrible fall when I come off it. Um, I think that's really disappointing that there's this big gap in services where you know, I see these people who uh, I think would really benefit from just good standard psychiatric care, but there's no pathways for them to access it unless they have the money to fund private psychiatry. And even then, wait lists for a lot of the psychiatrists that I would normally recommend have ballooned out to 2022, even in the private sector. So there's a real gap in services that I personally find really heartbreaking. So, on to my wish list, where I will also do some shameless self-promotion and plugging. Um, so... First of all, I think there's been a consistent theme throughout some of the presentations today that early consideration and planning for NDIS is absolutely vital. Okay? If it is waited until you go, oh golly, I think that NDIS is needed right about now, 
it's probably a little bit too late to start the process then. Obviously, please do still start it, um, but it would have been great if that had been started a year, six months ago, so that the services that are needed now are actually available when they're needed, rather than having to go through that long, long process. Um, I think it'd be super neat if we had greater research into more novel psychiatric medications within the Huntington's disease population. So what I mean by that is that within mental health itself, we've got all these new types of antipsychotics and things like that, that I think is just begging to be looked at within a Huntington's population. You know, maybe some of these treatments are going to provide better responses. We just don't know. Um, and we really need the trials to have a look at those. The best part about all this is that because they're actually already designed medications, the actual studies themselves are not as expensive as your traditional trials. Um, I personally would love to see greater research into the impacts of some of the non-pharmacological, so the non-medication strategies that we could use within Huntington's disease. In particular, an interest area of mine is sensory modulation, which is done through an occupational therapist to try and find things that don't require a lot of thinking, like smelling lavender, touching a squishy ball, um, maybe rubbing lotion, activating those five senses, uh, which I've seen within the mental health population have really amazing effects in decreasing distress and decreasing that anxiety for people that struggle with communication, that struggle with some of those more thinking parts of their brain. And I could see that being really well applied to people with Huntington's as well. And here comes the shameless plug and self-promotion. I'd really like to see us establish a bit of a Huntington psychiatry hub. Um, we've oh, I heard cheers from the background. Um, we've already got the Huntington's clinic, which is able to provide you know this assessment and recommendations. But I just really, really want to be able to follow people up and provide the core good psychiatric care and monitoring and treatment that we know works for people. I don't need to have someone come up with some fancy new medication to know that the basic principles of establishing a connection with someone, building that trust and engagement, and you know, talking with them is going to be beneficial for their mental health. You know, that validation of the distress that they're going through rather than having to say, well, it was lovely seeing you, we'll see you in a year's time, um, which is just, you know, I, again, this is my own view, I just don't think it's good enough. You know, we know how to treat mental health problems and it's not by, you know, saying, see you later. <laughs> it's by leaning in and actually providing that treatment for people. Um, I would actually, uh, I think there's another member of the audience who shares my very niche interests of Huntington's disease and uh, eating disorder management. Um, eating disorders has an incredibly successful model that's already been designed, I believe I've still got two minutes, um, where they have the Queensland Eating Disorder Service which provides a treatment branch where they provide treatment for people um, suffering eating disorders, but also a consultation branch where for people that maybe can't make it into their clinic or already have a treating team that wants to help, we're able to provide that consultation to the people that are able to provide that ongoing support um, to upskill the people that are already involved in someone's care. I'd love to see that applied to Huntington's. I think that'd be awesome. Um, but again, those are just my views. Um, I think we've got one minute for questions now, but we could also save it for the panel later on. Yeah, that's okay. Alrighty, thanks everyone for your time today. I really appreciate it. <laughs>